Jennifer dropped a question in one of my YouTube comments. She was working on graphing inequalities, but where she got stuck was with the fractions. You know, where does three halves appear on the number line? So let's take a look. In order to understand fractions like three halves, it's important to know that the top number plays a very different role in understanding value than the bottom number does. I know a lot of you are used to the words numerator and denominator. Most of my GED classes know those terms. They know what the top and bottom number are called, but often they don't know what those words even mean, why we use them. Numer, the beginning of that word numerator, means to count. It's the top number that tells us how many pieces we have. That's the counting number. It tells us how many. The denominator, however, it's not what that means. It doesn't mean to count. It doesn't tell us how many. In fact, the beginning of that word, denom, means to give name to, to name something. Um, like nombre uh, means name in Spanish. Denom is to give name to. So how do we name our fractions? What are we naming here? Well, remember, fractions are ways of talking about pieces or parts of numbers. And we name those parts according to their size. So the denominator, the bottom number, tells us the size of the pieces that we're looking at. So what I'm saying when I say three halves is I'm saying I have three pieces of size half. And now, weirdly, I want to talk about apples. Uh, I promise it has to do with fractions because the difference between a whole apple and a half apple is a lot. You know, if I gave me one whole apple and you one half of an apple and tried to convince you that we have the same amount, you'd have something to say to me. So what do apples have to do with fractions on a number line? Well, if you take a look at this number line, you see that these numbers, they don't have decimals, they don't have fractions, it's just our plain old regular numbers that we count with, you know, zero, one, two, three. Those kinds of numbers are called whole numbers. They have no pieces, no parts, they're whole. So when I look at those numbers, it's like referring to those whole apples. One is one whole apple, two, two whole apples, and so on. Because three halves has a three in it and a two in it, I totally understand why you might want to place that number between two and three. It seems to make sense. But what you're saying there is that you're saying you have more than two whole apples and less than three apples. But think about halves. Imagine you took two of those halves and you just kind of turn them towards each other and you put them back together. Well, those two halves would form a single apple, and then you'd have the other half you haven't used uh, for a total there of one and a half apples. So I can call it three halves, or I could call it one and a half apple. Now, clearly, you know, I don't have more than two apples. So we've got our three halves in the wrong spot. In fact, three halves is actually between one and two. It's more than one whole apple. Uh, but it's less than two whole apples. So let's transfer all this conceptual knowledge to our number line. So these numbers right here that we have, zero, one, two, three, like we said, they're the whole numbers, like our whole apples. Um, we don't have enough markings on this number line right now to really think properly about halves. If we wanna look at some number of halves, it's important to take our number line and break these whole units into halves. So here we go. Look at me. I've inserted these smaller lines in between each one of the units. I've halved each piece, slicing it into two equal pieces. You can see the one unit between zero and one has been halved. So, but same thing with the one between one and two. It's been halved. That was one unit and now it's been halved. And of course, the same thing with between two and three. Now we are prepared to look at halves. Now, I think this one's a little obvious. Halfway between zero and one is a little obvious. And most of us are comfortable with uh, using partly whole numbers and partly fractions. That's a, that's a safe place for a lot of us. It's where we started in elementary school learning about fractions. So most of us would call this space between one and two, one 
and a half, one whole apple and a half an apple. And this space between two and three, we would term similarly, two and one half, two whole apples and a half an apple. That's what we're saying when we use that kind of language. But it's not the only way to count the same amount. We could count entirely by halves, only count half an apple at a time, and not consider any of those whole apples. Imagine we took all of our apples and cut them into pieces and just counted that. So obviously, if I had no halves in front of me, I could call that zero halves. One way to think about zero is that you have no halves. Now, it's kind of a silly way. I wouldn't walk around saying, you guys, I have no $1 bills and no $5 bills and no hundreds. Well, unless I was probably trying to borrow some money from you. But anyway, here I'm saying I have no halves, which should be an obvious statement based on the fact that we're at zero. And then we can start counting from there, just like we usually would. That first tick mark is going to give me one half. But I'm not going to skip my whole numbers when I do this, because guess what? One thing is the same amount as having two halves. Yes, I've sliced it into pieces, but it's the same amount. If I give me one apple and you two halves, our fight is over. We really do have the same amount. Now, you might get mad at me because your apple's turning a little brown, but you can't argue that we have the same amount of apple. And now we're going to keep counting that way. Look, the next tick, tick then, if you give me another half, is three halves. And it just counts like that. Remember we said the numerator is the counter. It's just the top we see change as we move down this number line. The bottom's not changing because the halves are the size of the pieces, and we cut our number line into equal sized pieces already. It's been chopped into halves, and now we're counting how many we have. We're numering, we're counting with that numerator. So then we have four halves. Two apples is the same as having four half apples, five halves, and six halves. Now, there's names for these numbers. Good news if that's, um, you know, if you're a GED student, you can just turn off the video now because the GED is not a vocab test. You will not need to know these names of numbers, but it's just a good thing to know. If you hear them used, you can kind of understand this. When we look at all those numbers before one, when we have less than a whole apple, we call those kinds of fractions proper fractions. One half is a proper fraction. Okay, but once we get past one, I mean, look on the left-hand side of that line. You can see up above the line, it said one half for that first mark. Down below the line, we see one half. You know, when it was less than one, there's only one way to call it. But where students get confused is look at the right side of the line. The same tick mark has different names. Up above, I'm using this mix of whole numbers and fractions. That has a name. When you use a mix of whole numbers and fractions, we call that mixed numbers, which would, should make sense. We're using a mix of different style of numbers to describe our value. But it's not the only way to do it. As we saw below, we could count purely with fractions. We could ignore holes, not count holes, and only count pieces. And if we're doing that, that's what's called an improper fraction. And I almost wish we could change the name of improper fractions. I really do from the bottom of my heart. Because elementary school teachers do our students a real disservice sometimes, and it's not their faults. They're dealing with you guys who are really concrete thinkers. They know that it's really much easier for the average person to think about one and a half apples than it is for them to think three halves. And so this term improper fractions, they will teach you guys convert, convert, convert. We can't have improper. I mean, listen to that word. Those fractions are not proper for polite society. Convert as fast as you can. We're scared of them. And by the time you reach GED level, we're looking at a high school level of understanding. We're progressing into college and we use improper fractions all day long. So that's why I wish that we would use a term like pure fractions or something of that nature. Um, because 
they're not improper. They're super useful. We use them all the time in high school. It's way easier to multiply and divide with impropers than it is with mixed numbers. And so uh, mathematicians generally prefer them. And you guys are scared of them uh, because I think of that connotation that we got from elementary school and that scariness of that word improper. Okay, so you need to relax down. You need to be okay with these improper fractions so you don't get panicked on your GED. Now, don't worry about the conversion like, Kate, please finish this video with how do I go back and forth? I don't need you actually necessarily to be able to do that. If you were gonna do the conversion on the GED, you could use your calculator. Or if you get really sticky stuck and you're mad at me, you could literally draw a picture of apples and chop them in half or pies or pizzas or whatever you need to use. Okay. So skip the math for now and let's understand fractions. The GED is a reasoning test, not a computation test. If you don't understand what you're looking at, you really don't stand a very big shot of passing your test. I want to take a minute to thank everyone who supports Light and Salt Learning, and I hope that you will too. I created um, my YouTube channel originally, and now there's many more resources than that, but I did that because what I found is that those people who most need help to get their GED done are often those who can least afford the kind of specialized help they need. And so I wanted to make resources available for those students who couldn't afford a private tutor, who couldn't afford uh, math books and um, specialized schools and thing of, things of that nature. And so all these people are those who've come alongside me wanting to provide that as well. They want to make sure that each and every one of you has access to the resources that they need. So just a big thank you for those of you who support me monthly. I have three levels of patronage on my channel that you can support me as a patron. Um, there are a few of you who do the light insult level with that $15 a month commitment, and I so appreciate you. But I really appreciate everybody. Those who are sprinkling a salt at that middle grade with the $9 a month commitment, you're a blessing. And for many of my students, they don't have a lot of disposable income. They tend to come in at that $3 a month level, and I appreciate you just as much. I love how you are paying it forward to help enable other students to have access to the same resources that you found so valuable. I just want to thank everyone as well who maybe gave a one-off donation. I know those are easier and less scary with the lack of commitment. Um, over on Buy Me a Coffee, you guys have shown me support, been so generous, and just help me stay encouraged when this got very challenging. So thank you to all my supporters. And if you are um, just willing to come alongside and help me continue this work, you will bless me as well as blessing students across the world to help them accomplish their goals.